Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Pat Fagan. I work here at Family Research Council in the Marriage and Religion Research Institute. It's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Mark Regneris. Uh, Mark is one of my professional ideals, icons, and I am, as I am sure he is to many, many people in sociology and in the social sciences. Um, He's run into some controversy in recent years by being brave and audacious with the data. Um, prior to that, and this is what I want uh, those who are listening and I'd like the whole country to know, prior to that, Mark's stature within sociology was national ranking. That was universally held by all sociologists who knew Mark and Mark's work. And his work's quality has only increased since then. Um, he did his uh, doctorate degree at uh, North Carolina, uh, the University of North Carolina, uh, under uh, Christian Smith, was his co-chair. And Christian Smith is one of the eminent sociologists and uh, just recently has authored a book called uh, The Sacred Project of American Sociology. It's a wonderful book, relatively short, and Mark Regneris is going to talk to us now about stability and change in America's rela Americans' relationships from his own big national survey. Um, Mark and his work really follow and give an example of the sacred project of American sociology. I'll give you. Mark Regneris from the University of Texas at Austin. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Pat. Uh, it's good to be here with you today. Um, today I want to talk about some slides. Do I have the control of the slides? I forget. There we go. I want to talk you through uh, a particular data set that we uh, co collected last year. Um, called the Relationships in America Project. But before that, you may have seen me in some other context talk about this slide, which is this is from the American Community Survey collected by the Census uh, Bureau. It's pretty striking, and it kind of sets the context for subsequent discussion uh, on attitudes around marriage and family and behaviors and practices, etc. Uh, this is you know, this is shocking to me in some ways. From 2000 to 2013, the line of people in that sort of sweet spot of marrying has crossed between those who are married and those who have never been married. I mean, there may be people in this room who's like, I would love to be on that blue line, but I'm on the white, the red line uh, because I haven't been asked, right? And yeah, it's, a, it's a sensitive issue, but it's also sort of, it's kind of the this, this setting in which we're talking about this as you see this. The, the lines have crossed, and they don't seem to be like bending back towards each other, right? So we're talking about uh, what in 2000, which is, you know, it seems like yesterday to most of us, was a 21 percentage point gap between those who were married and those who had never been married in this sweet spot of 25 to 34-year-olds. Now they've crossed, and now we're at, I believe it's a, like an 11 percentage point gap in the other direction with no sign of, of, of curving back inwards. So we're talking about a decidedly different America that we're fielding questions to. So I want to talk to you about this particular survey project. So 15,738 completed cases, right? By comparison, the New Family Structure Study, of which got me all sorts of fame and infamy, was in the end, 2,988 completed cases. We had, we had uh, screened about 15,000, but we only asked them a handful of questions. Here we have extensive information from uh, a lot of people, enabling us to sort of s slice the pie pretty narrowly. And in, uh, on relationshipsinamerica.com, uh, there's a report. We issued a survey report on basic sort of religion, marriage, family, et cetera. That came out in November. I'll have a couple slides from that today, but I'm going to focus on marriage and family attitudes from that report and provide some new information about um, 
where people are at on a handful of um, particular attitudes about marriage. So this is 18 to 60 year old Americans. You think, well, 60, 50 year olds, oh, we already know what they think. And 18 to 25 year olds, we already know what they think. Well, I think you're going to be a little bit surprised, right? There's actually a thousand cases that overlap with the New Family Structures study, enabling us, I don't show it here, but enabling us to do uh, over time analyses of the same set of people. National representative population based excellent survey, and it's only roughly a year old, right? In data terms, that's like yesterday, right? I mean, people still use the Ad Health Project from in, in adolescence, and that's, you know, boy, that's pushing 20 years now. Uh, so this is relatively recent data from last year, completed in English or Spanish. Let's uh, go straight to the point of the talk, is on people's attitudes about relationships and marriage. I usually don't write a lot about attitudes. I'm more of a behavior kind of guy. I'd like to know what people do, not necessarily what people think. People can think all sorts of things. And yet, um, I, in terms of public opinion, it's good to have accurate barometers of where people are at on various subjects, right? So I'm going to talk about, let's see, we've got seven attitudes here. I'm going to talk intensively over the next few minutes about five or six of them, right? And you kind of see the, the reds are agree with this statement, agree or strongly agree. We pooled them together. Uh, disagree is in yellow, and that blue category is neutral, but technically it's, they said they neither agree nor disagree. And actually, a good share of my talk is going to focus on this group because I think they're pretty important. So when you look at it, um, it's a good idea for couples considering marriage to live together. So attitudes about cohabitation are the most sort of affirmed of the seven things we asked about here. 44% of Americans agreed with that. A quarter disagreed that it's a good idea. And 30% are fence-sitting. They're not really sure. They neither agree nor disagree. But if you look at, just look at the blue, right? 30, 27, 29, 33, 28, 24, and 18. Only when we get down to talking about extramarital sex do we see something below 20%. And 18 is still significant, right? We have a considerable number of people in America who, I don't know, I really can't say that I agree with this. I can't say I disagree with it. Fence sitters, not politically active, typically speaking, but it does mean that there's a lot of, uh, in play, right? And we'll talk more about that in a second. Gay marriage, 42% agree, 31% disagree, and 27% fence it. Now, I think I wrote a, uh, a short spiel about that, but when you look at sort of uh, press releases on support for gay marriage, usually the way in which the question is asked is kind of a forced choice. You agree with this or disagree with this? And we, you know, I, mean, I wasn't trying to, to do a, uh, sort of a, a media blurb on the subject. I wanted to know where people are at. And so you've got to give them an out. And meaning like they've, they've got to be able to say, I don't know yet. I'm, I don't know where I stand on that. And so 27% of the country a year ago said they weren't sure. They neither agreed with it or nor disagreed with it. And the way I wrote the question, I mean, is to be as straight forward as possible. I mean, there's lots of different ways you can ask these questions. And the way you ask questions matters on this domain. The third one is sort of basically no strings attached, less support for that. Couples with kids should stay married unless there's physical or emotional abuse. I won't talk a whole lot about that today. A little bit less support for that. Then we have there are basically our polyamory. Is it OK for three or more adults to live together in a sexual romantic relationship? Not really polygamy, because I didn't talk about marriage in it, but polyamory, which uh, our mainstream press is loving lately, it's so far as I can tell. I re see about it in Slate, Atlantic, uh, Time, you name it. Um, but a lot of people f don't think marriage is outdated. Only 10% of the country sort of says, yes, this has had its day. Although almost a quarter say, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. And finally, there's still uh, not much support for extramarital sex, which is good, right? OK, so I'm going to walk you through some of these and look at different breakdowns uh, by age, gender, church attendance, and uh, some political orientation stuff, and family of origin uh, issues. All right. So back to that, marriage is an outdated institution. We already saw that 10% agreed, 24% disagreed. I'm sorry, we're neutral and 66% disagreed, OK? Where do we see some differences? Can I stroll around? Can you hear me OK? All right. <clears throat> so 
there's not really a strong difference in gender on this stuff or sex. It's always tricky. Like, am I talking about sex or am I talking about gender? Now, gender morphs into a, a different kind of thing than I, we used to sort of ag ag agree on it. But I write about sex, so I don't really like to talk about male, female as sex. Be that as it may. All right. One thing that you'll see plenty of today is this 25 to 34 year old category. Uh, more indecisiveness on a lot of matters than the 18 to 24, right? So t people tend to think, oh, it's that youngest category is the most permissive on almost everything. And it's just not true. The 25 to 34 year olds and sometimes the 35 to 44 year olds are even more permissive on some things, right? But generally speaking, we don't see a lot of people saying marriage is outdated, especially the oldest group. But it's not a gigantic difference, right? Church attendance, you see the sort of predictable weekly influence of this. Now, what about uh, marital status, right? Obviously, if you're married, you probably should be invested in the institution. Most are, not everyone. There are some people who are fence-sitting who are like, I'm not sure given what I've experienced, whether this is outdated or not. But obviously, people who are cohabiting are more ambivalent about uh, marriage as an institution than people who are married. And divorce looks a little bit less so, and never married, uh, more ambivalence. So if you think about sort of the cohabiting population, either agree or are neutral. They're neither agreeing or disagreeing. More than half of them are either agreed or unsure about marriage as an institution. So you can see that cohabitation kind of stimulates this stuff as it would make sense because there are picking against uh, marriage, at least for the moment, right? Parents' marital status, I'm going to go through that several times today, but I'm not going to talk a lot, about, a, lot, a lot about it because it didn't matter as much as one might suspect it did. Now, among the people who are cohabiting, what's interesting is that a lot of people pref would prefer to be married, right? So both men and women, half of all cohabiting men and 59% of cohabiting women prefer to be married right now, right? People who are dating, right? Not even necessarily that serious. 42% of them said, I would like to be, of men would like to be married right now. 51% of women said that. So even though people are not sure about the institution cohabiting, they still would actually prefer to be married on average. Now, what about their political orientation and their voting intentions? Okay, this is Family Research Council. I thought, well, let's talk a little, let's throw a little politics in there. <clears throat> um, politics, religion, sexuality, they are tracking together now probably, arguably, more than they ever have, right? So the, the people who are most likely to vote uh, for the GOP's presidential candidate in 2016, which is, of course, unknown, uh, very few of them agree, about 5% say it, marriage is an outdated institution. As, and as you become very unlikely, it's still only 12%, right? So America is kind of on board with the idea that marriage is not outdated, although there's a share that are unsure. Political orientation is an even sort of stronger predictor, maybe not so much of this, but of a variety of other uh, outcomes. All right, moving from Marriage is outdated to it's a good idea for couples to consider cohabitation, which is the most sort of affirmed idea uh, among these marriage and family attitudes. Okay? So among men, a little bit more likely than women uh, to consider marriage, uh, uh, consider cohabiting a good idea. Right? We're, but we're still like a little bit under 50%, but it's a big gap that's not sure, okay? both among men and women. And if you see the 18 to 24 year olds look like, like 25 to 34 year olds. And if you think, oh, it's these senior citizens or older folks, I probably shouldn't call people between 55 and 64 senior citizens, should I? Um, over the hill? Over the hill? Uh, your words, not mine. <clears throat> we may think, oh, these people resist cohabiting because they didn't. Well, that wasn't that long ago, and plenty of them did. And you just don't see quite the pronounced age effects that you think might occur, right? So sure, the red bar is significantly over from there. But you combine red and yellow, and you've got, they're all within the same 75% either agreeing or neutral on this subject, right? Cohabitation has become normative in America. And so it's not surprising that as an attitude, it's become normative as well, too, right? Even church attendance, so weekly church attenders in the United States 
Uh, about 18% say, good idea. And another, let's see, a little over 20. So you wind up with a little bit over 40% of the weekly church-going population in the United States, regardless of affiliation, which I don't control for here, saying, yeah, this is probably not a bad idea. What about them, their marital status, right? Obviously, if you're cohabiting, you're going to think it's probably a decent idea, although that yellow bar, I'm not sure. These are people who are cohabiting and are not sure it's a good idea, right? And conceptually, right? So that's about, that's, over, that's 25, 26, 27 percent of people who are cohabiting are not sure if it's a good idea or not. Not necessarily theirs, but their, the, the, the attitude in general, okay? And again, down to parents' marital status, you, the, the, the most conservative or least permissive groups are going to be those who are still married or those who are married until one, of the, or, or one or both of their parents passed away. They look quite similar. In fact, these tend to look more conservative than those. Partly an age effect is caught up in there. I mean, you're more likely to be a little older if your parents are both uh, deceased. Politics, okay? Not a strong effect, but a stronger effect on political orientation than the likelihood of uh, voting. Right? But it's a little linear, as you can see. Um, so basically, the most liberal groups, quite similar, right? If you package them together, over 60% agree that this is a good idea. That's two thirds right there. Tack on the unsures, and you're almost up to 90% of liberal or very liberal Americans think cohabitation is perfectly fine, right? Only the very conservative, really, stand out, right? It's even a leap from here to here. And by the way, we're not talking about a very large population here, right? This room notwithstanding, right? These are probably 3 to 5%, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, it really is quite a, a normal curve that leans a little bit liberal, but not by much. No strings attached sex. Again, a fair amount of ambivalence. One of the key themes in this talk is the ambivalence of 25 to 30 percent of Americans on some of these matters, right? Not a whole lot of an age effect, okay? You might think, oh, the older part of the sample should not like this idea. Whether they've experienced it or not, I don't know, but there's really not a great deal of an age effect here. A little bit, but not pronounced by any stretch. People tend to frame uh, marriage and family attitudes as all about age. It's, it's convenient, it uh, plays well as a blurb, you can write about it, etc., and feel good about yourself, but you're really not telling a great deal of truth when you're saying that. Men, more on board with this than women. The same is true on extramarital sex. It is not true on gay marriage, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. A standard religiosity effect that we would expect. At the same time, you know, you might be a glass half empty saying, wow, almost 30% of the population of weekly church attenders think this is either okay or they're not sure. Typically, people are interpreting this question, so far as I can tell, as not about marriage. It's about two unmarried persons, although the question was not worded that way. But when we did word the question that way around extramarital sex, support for it is uh, certainly a lot more compressed than for here. Marital status. Uh, Obviously, the big difference between married and cohabiting. Um, but still, you know, among people, current people who are currently married, over 50% either agree with it or aren't sure, right? I don't want to piece those two together. But if you're looking for people who's like, this is a bad idea, no. I mean, we're talking about 42% uh, of the married population saying this is a bad idea, and less among other groups. Parental marriage status, again, not a whole lot of difference. These look a lot like this, okay? And these two track fairly tightly together. Politics, same story, although one of the things that, by the third time you've seen a slide like this, political orientation is a little bit stronger of a predictor than is sort of the likelihood of voting for the GOP in 2016, which may involve sort of like a, a rebound effect, or I, I, you know, I voted for present then, but now I think uh, I'm not sure about that. So it may not have as much to do with political conservatism as a where do you consider yourself, which is more of a pure uh, uh, assessment of uh, their own political self-identity. Again, a solid difference between very conservative and conservative, and all the way up. The difference between liberal and very liberal is not very much. But if you look at those who disagree here, we've got 
let's see, almost 70% of the population of very conservatives think this is a bad idea, 50% of the conservative population. 28, 18, 19, right? So politics does distinguish here pretty well. Now, here's extramarital sex. This is kind of the, the least likely to, for any kind of group of Americans to agree on it, okay? So let's focus on the red for a second, okay? Our reds are pretty uncommon. None of them even approach 20%. Those who rarely or never attend church, maybe 10% agree. And I wrote the question, uh, or the, the statement, it is sometimes permissible for a married person to have sex with someone other than their spouse. I'm trying to give an out, to mean, it's, it's sometimes permissible. So they, so they didn't have to say it is never or always. I wanted to see like if there was any budge room in that, right? And some people took it and ran with it a little bit. But otherwise, it's still... Uh, People are not on board with it, but what is interesting here is the yellow categories are pretty significant. Okay? I mean, we're talking about among 25 to 34 year old Americans, that's roughly 20% of the population, a little over, who say, you know, I don't know, I neither agree nor disagree with that statement. Okay? Obviously, it matters uh, when we looked at marital status, right? 8%, 7% of married Americans. Think it's okay? Sometimes permissible. Another 12 to 15% say, mm, I don't know, maybe, maybe not, right? Cohabiting Americans is a little bit more likely, right? But they're sort of speculating. They're talking about married persons when they themselves are cohabiting. Divorced, never married, look quite a bit like married with a little bit more of a, I don't know, neutral gap, right? Same thing with parental marital status. It's not a great predictor of this particular variable, right? What about political perspective, okay? Same kind of story, but what is, jumps out here is uh, uh, people who perceive themselves as very liberal, right? Let's, let's go back here, right? I said nowhere on the sort of gender, age, church attendance thing do you get over 10% of support. And here I've got 25% of the most very liberal Americans say, I agree, it is sometimes permissible, okay? So you've definitely got, an, a, you know, politics and um, sexuality are tracking together here fairly tightly. Very conservative and conservatives look a lot alike. The question of the day, it should be legal for gays and lesbians to marry in America. I guess we'll find out in June. But where do people stand on this, right? Again, it's been framed as a youth issue when it really is not a spectacularly so. Okay? Yes, here, the youngest group most likely to agree. Right? But if you look at the, the, the gap, it's about 48, 47% of 18 to 24 year olds agree or strongly agree. Compared to 55 to 60 or 4 year olds, we're talking 38%. Okay? Not a huge difference. Age is not the greatest predictor of this stuff. right? nor is gender, although here women are historically always been more likely to support it than uh, men have. Church attendance, obviously, a pretty strong predictor, although um, we're almost at 20% of weekly church attenders supporting the idea of legal same-sex marriage. But one of the things that is um, worth reiterating here is the amount of people who are, haven't made up their minds, right? I mean, it's, perhaps it's no longer a public opinion uh, subject that may or may not matter, but if you take that red bar, it doesn't hit 50, even among 18 to 24 year olds. So if you wanted to look at the glass half full from your angle, you've got about 26% support among the youngest group who th disagree that there ought to be same-sex marriage, tack on the 20 plus percent who aren't sure, and you've got a plurality there, more than 50%. Marital status, married and divorced, think quite a bit alike on this subject. Um, cohabiting, never married, more liberal, very predictable. Parental marital status, not a whole lot, uh, not a lot of value added. That's a consistent theme here, uh, which surprised me to some extent. By the way, I mean, so just to be clear, this is the, the respondent's parents, right? This is the respondent's marital status and their 
what the deal is with their parents. And here we see how, just how politicized this issue has become, okay? both in terms of the likelihood of the future presidential vote, certainly for political orientation. Liberal and very liberal Americans, uh, squarely above 70%, tack on the, the ones of those who are not sure, who will lean in favor of it, and you're talking about right close to 90%. Whereas that's not the case with conservative and very conservative Americans. Although this group, which is notably larger than this group, has a significantly larger undecided pack. Polyamory, right around the corner. Less support. Let's go back just to take a snapshot. Let's see. Burn that one in your brain. Close your eyes and then go to here, okay? So definitely less support for polyamory. And I'm not talking about multiple marriage. I'm talking about sort of is it okay for three or more consenting adults to live together in, in what I wrote down as a sexual or romantic relationship, okay? Again, a lot of consternation at the youngest uh, Americans, right? Almost 30 percentage points of them and the 25 to 34 is not sure, right? There's a lot of unsurety in this, this slide. I think we're about 25% of this oldest group, right, are unsure. And that's the smallest share of people who are unsure about this issue. Men more on board with this than women. Church attenders not on board with it at all, really, uh, unless you want to read into this, which is about 18% or so. So less support for this than gay marriage, but more support for it than um, extramarital affairs. Your own marital status, predictably, having either being married or having been divorced, uh, roughly comparable, cohabiting, more support for it. So in, in some ways one could say glass is half empty, glass is half full. You've got cohabiting, which is the normative, not the normative experience in this data set, but the normative experience that people ever do, right? Americans don't cohabit for all that long. Um, but it's an experience that most people go through, right? We're talking about 60% of them either agree or are unsure about the morality of polyamory. Again, here, very predictable political orientation on this. Um, since we you know, weren't really talking about this 10 years ago, it pays to sort of see here at the bottom of the, the pack, right, you've got among liberal Americans, 30 plus percent agree that this is fine, 42, 43% of the most liberal agree this is fine. You tack on the, well, I don't know, who typically lean in the direction of being more permissive, but here they're, they're generally not sure. And we're talking about two-thirds, 70% uh, of very liberal Americans either agree with this or, hey, I'm not going to get in the way, I don't know what I think about it. Um, Again, the two are tightly connected in the United States together. All right, so some reflections on what we're seeing here. One of the things when I look at this data set is there's a lot up for grabs, right? You can look at this and get depressed. It depends on your perspective. You can look at this and be pleased. But when I see this, I think, wow, Americans, there's a lot of fence sitters. There's a lot of wooing to be done one way or the other, right? Another thing is that younger Americans are not quite as permissive as we're making them out to be. Sure, a little bit more so, but the assumption would be, sort of the conventional wisdom is that they're heads and tails away from the oldest Americans on these kinds of attitudes and questions, and they're not, right? Not double by any stretch. More so, but not double. Obviously, as I just mentioned, political liberalism is a great tracker of permissiveness. We see religion and family tracking together more tightly uh, than we used to. And if I had to bet the farm on something, that you'll see sort of religion and, and attitudes and practices around marriage being more tightly connected in the future than you have seen in the past. 
Here's something I haven't talked about. I'm going to skip forward to uh, these slides. We had, I don't know, 900 some odd Spanish dominant households in this study, enough to sort of carve them out and look at them separately. One of the things that struck me is that African American and Latino households that are Spanish speaking look quite a bit alike in their attitudes on this and l much less permissive than white. Latino English speaking and other, which is mostly Asian and then a combination of other uh, types of uh, ethnicities. This is for decisions to cohabit. This is for uh, extramarital sex. Right? Black and Latino Spanish speaking households, the least permissive. No strings attached sex. One of the things you should notice, too, is how tightly connected white and Latino English-speaking households are. I mean, over a generation or two, they tend to look quite a bit alike on attitudes around marriage and family. Same-sex marriage, second and fourth category, the least likely to support it. But as you can tell, the most likely to be ambivalent about it, right? Not ambivalent as in disagreeing with it, but not knowing what to think about it, right? So both Latino Spanish speaking and African American households, uh, more than 40%, in one case almost 50%, sort of, I don't know. I neither agree nor disagree. I mean, that's a, that's a lot of people to say, 50% of the population to say, I can't agree with that, I can't disagree with that, okay? A lot of fence sitting on that. Polyamory, again. Latino, Spanish speaking, very few agree, right? Less than 10%. African American, a little over 11%. Whites, almost 20. All right. So, in some ways, one of the, the, the reflection you can have is that uh, African Americans and Latino, Spanish speaking households are really sort of, they are set apart from everybody else when you group them together and look at their attitudes on these things. You also see sort of a sense of, there's a, a complementarity that remains fairly obvious and functional. You see gender differences fairly stably, not powerful ones, but men and women seem to come at some of these questions distinctively uh, based on sort of long-standing predictable patterns about their behavior. Now, I talked, I'm talking about a little bit about stability and a little bit about change. We see, obviously, clear gender distinctions that are present in thinking about relationships. And this is sort of, some of these reflections are more of a broader view, not just from this data. But uh, when we, especially when we talk to people, the last time we uh, fielded a sort of qualitative component to our research, we asked about marriage, and mostly to people who are not married. And there's this sense of marriage continues to be about children. Okay? But there's a tight connection between uh, expecting children when you marry or you marry when it's time to have children kind of thing. So that's, the latter is more typical today than uh, perhaps 20 or 30 years ago. But the, regardless of decision to cohabit or not, people equate marriage with a family. That's fairly stable. A little bit less so among the youngest population. Right? People who are least likely, or most likely to marry under age 25 are the most religious population in the U.S. They're actually the least likely in some ways to equate marriage with children because most of them expect to wait several years before they have children, which is its own unique uh, um, factoid. I'm not going to unpack that here today. Marriage ability of men is a huge deal, always has been always will be to some extent, right? What it does mean is that we see um, in the decision making of women around particular men, uh, the evaluation of like, their earning power, not in sort of a raw brute sense, but sort of a um, men signal their readiness for marriage by sort of, uh, by their sort of ability to hold down a job that pays decently, et cetera. And even though we're moving rapidly into an era where women don't really need men to work either full-time or to bring home a lot of money in order to 
to keep a household afloat because they're, generally speaking, working too. Now, they may have their mind on what they may wish to do in a few years with the children and family, but the marriageability of men has long been the, the, the signal of, uh, to women, and, it, and it's closely connected to sort of their opportunities and their earning power. Very little support here to violating marriage, although there's some differences about what that means, what is, how, how do we define marriage. But sort of, there's a, a sense that marriage is set apart, it's not outdated, and you shouldn't cheat, right? Um, and then I covered that last one. Marriage is not outdated. Now, what's changing, right? In step with sort of the, the marriageability thing uh, is women need it less, right? If I had to predict, if I had to, to, to sort of say, well, why are, why are, do we have, uh, do I still have this? Why is this occurring? One could sort of blame women, which is not fair. More women want to marry than men, so we're not going to do that. But they need marriage less. And when you need marriage less, uh, you'd be slower to enter the institution. Now, will desire with it shrink? Okay? That's something that we need to track better for the future. There's a difference between sort of wanting marriage as an idea, theoretically, and being on a pathway to enter it in some ways. I mean, they are really two different things, right? So desire with it, I mean, if we were talking about, um, do I have this cultural lag? All right, on the bottom I talk about cultural lag, right? When something has happened technologically, right, and economically, right? How long does it take for sort of the reality, the desire to do something, catch up with it? So we're now sort of in a period where women need to marry far less than they used to in an, an older economy. Does that, will that signal declining interest in getting married? We haven't seen too much of that yet because most Americans, uh, young Americans who are unmarried, still wish to be married. Right? Marriage billion men is both really important and we're seeing declining marriageability. Uh, Brad Wilcox talks about this. Plenty of sociologists of family are talking about this. It's not really disputed. What's disputed is sort of what to do about it, obviously. But we definitely see sort of um, the share of men who are in a position to be attractive uh, to women in terms of their earning power, et cetera, that has shrunk, okay? And uh, I'd say it's above my pay grade to go into why that is or what to do about it. But definitely there's a lot of hand-wringing going on. And there ought to be because uh, this is kind of a the most important indicator for men's marriageability. There's also, um, as I mentioned before, higher standards of women because they need marriage less. All that creates this environment where you've got the X uh, in terms of the share of married and unmarried. Now, there's an unclear number of men who have taken themselves off of the, the market, so to speak, which is really difficult to discern. I mean, if I had some sort of indicators of that, um, you know, do you live at home? Do you play video games, watch a lot of porn? I guess that's how we would detect off the market. But it's really, it's not a simplistic thing to do, right? And it's, so basically, we know it exists. There's an unclear number of men who have taken themselves off, which creates, frankly, a sex ratio problem in the mating market. And in another hat I wear, I talk a lot about sort of power dynamics when the balance of men and women in different parts of the mating market have tipped. And uh, so if you take a share of men out of the mating market altogether, that leaves the remainder with, a great, uh, with a greater power in how to navigate and negotiate relationships. So it's not just that these are sad sacks, it's too bad. They've also, their sort of withdrawal from the mating market hurts the pool of women who are interested in marriage. People are just starting now, I think, to notice that. Right? Um, I wrote a piece in First Things back in November called The Pornographic Double Bind. I won't go into detail here. You can look at it. Uh, it ruffled some fetters, which is fine. Um, but one of the things I heard in sort of the, the commentaries about that is women starting to, f to put pieces together thinking, 
men's penchant for pornography is contributing to my troubles finding stable relationship. Like, finally, the two are coming together in the sense of, I think this might have something to do with that. I've long thought that in a market sense, right? It's hard to figure out in an individual sense, even though we all live uh, only in the individual, um, sort of what's going on in our world and the people we know. But I, I've seen it in the, the market sense, or uh, speculated about it. Um, but we have a difficult time measuring it. All right. And obviously, something that has also changed is sort of marriage as a foundation, which it was for a bajillion years, so to speak, to uh, its, its place as a symbolic capstone of the good life, right? We are squarely in the symbolic capstone part of uh, human history around marriage right now. It is far more symbolic than it is functional. It remains functional, right? And this is back to the idea about sort of uh, the flight from marriage in the working class that Brad and some others work on, is that the sort of the middle and upper middle classes really have a s solid sense of marriage as a symbolic partnership, your bestest best friend, whereas uh, tracking in sociologist James Hunter's line uh, that elites set the tone for cultural change, even the working class and poor want the same things out of marriage. But, you know, in some ways, uh, the symbolic remains out of reach when it's functioning. I mean, we all do, but some people need it more than others, right? So we've got a widespread failure to launch. That's what happens in this, both among the elites and among uh, the lower middle class, working class, signaling that maybe this sort of cultural lag is starting to catch up with reality, right? You want to marry. But really, the bar has risen if you're a woman, or your ability to reach marriageability has, has been stunted if you're a man, such that we've got this X thing, and I think they're tightly connected. All right, I'm going to stop there and be happy to uh, answer questions at your leisure. Thanks.